Last week, President uh, Obama pledged that during his administration he'd see, and I quote, that scientific data is never distorted or concealed to serve a political agenda, and that we make scientific decisions based on facts, not ideology, end of quote. Viewing this commitment through the lens of global warming gives us some hope that President Obama will break from the ranks of the lockstep conformity that is demanded of the politicized scientists concerning the issue of global warming. Perhaps now we can get on with discovering the truth through science, not chicken little science, but real science, and leave the political pressure out of it. Unfortunately, up to today, politicians like Vice President Al Gore have done their best to silence the rational voices of scientists who have been skeptical of Mr. Gore's agenda. Let no one forget Vice President Al Gore. His first act as Vice President was to insist that Dr. William Happer be fired as chief scientist for the Department of Energy. Dr. Happer apparently had uttered words indicating that he was open-minded to the issue of global warming. So off with his head, out the door. They wanted someone who was going to provide grants only to scientists who would verify this man-made global warming theory. Dr. Happer was relieved in 1993, the first year of the Clinton-Gore administration. So over a decade, all we have heard is a one-sided drum, drum beat. Dr. William Gray, now Emeritus Professor of Atmospheric Science at the Colorado State University and a fellow of the American Meteorological Society, verified this. Co quote, I had no money for 30 years, uh, Gray recounted, and when the Clinton administration came in and Gore started directing some of that vi environmental stuff, I was cut off. I couldn't get any money from NOAA. They turned me down 13 straight proposals, uh, uh, end of quote. This man is one of the most prominent hurricane experts in the world who before received grants uh, for study and scientific grants, but after Clinton Gore, he's turned down 13 straight times. This gross intimidation of other scientists was done to lay the foundation, because if it could happen to this prominent scientist, it was going to happen to them, but it was done to lay down a foundation for a radical agenda that would change our life. The first-hand picked scientist uh, had, first of all, the first thing they had to do was to have hand-picked scientists create fear that the planet was in jeopardy. Then these hand-picked scientists had to lie about everybody agreeing uh, to, that, uh, to that type of, of prediction. Unfortunately, for all those scientists who went along with this scheme, now, over a decade later, there is a big problem. The claim that the science is clear and there is a consensus that humans are directly responsible for global warming is now clearly wrong as it is dishonest. Why is it clearly wrong? Because it has not been getting warmer for the last eight years, and it is harder for everybody to ignore that fact, especially as more and more scientists are stepping up and pointing it out. It's not getting any coal any warmer. In fact, it hasn't been getting warmer for eight years. In January, a U.S. Senate minority report stated over 650 dissenting scientists from around the globe challenged man-made global warming claims made by the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and former Vice President, as well as disagreeing with former Vice President Al Gore. The esteemed scientists being referred to come from a wide range of disciplines. Several are Nobel Prize winners and many work at the most respected scientific institutions in the world. They totally disagree with the theory. They call it into question, this man-made global theory claim. Finally, just last year, the Oregon Institute of Science and Medicine uh, released the names of some 31,478 scientists who signed a petition rejecting the claims of human-caused global warming. Of those 31,000, uh, 9,029 have PhDs. 
Many currently work in climatology, meteorology, atmospheric and environmental and geophysical studies, as well as astronomical studies, as well as the biological fields that directly relate to the climate change controversy. So, there is no consensus. Thousands upon scientists are disagreeing with what has been, fo what the, what has been foisted upon us. Yet, we are bombarded by radical environmentalists and the media and the media hype with the common refrain, case closed, the global warming is real. It is repeated over and over again. Case closed, global warming is real. Well, it's repeated as if it was a mantra by religious zealots. It was pounded into the public consciousness over the airways and in print and even in congressional hearings. Case closed. Well, this was obviously a brazen attempt to end open discussion and to silence differing views, dismissing the need to explore legitimate contrary arguments on both sides of the issue. And again, there are hundreds of prominent scientists and meteorologists and heads of science departments at major universities, Nobel Prize winners and others who are highly skeptical and highly critical of this man-made global warming theory. But case closed, we shouldn't even listen to their arguments. There is Dr. Richard Lenzen, for example, of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He has been an adamant in his opposition as has Dr. William Gray, who I mentioned a moment ago, a world-renowned hurricane expert and fellow at the American Meteorological S Society. He recently pointed out that the 15-year prediction by global warming activists that the Earth would by now be suffering many more and many se more severe hurricanes, that that prediction was dead wrong. It doesn't come from me. It becomes from Dr. Uh, William Gray, one of the most renowned hurricane experts in the world who could not get a research grant during the, uh, during the Clinton-Gore administration. So let us note, not only is the, plant not, uh, the planet not getting warmer, hurricanes are at a 30-year low. But these views, and so many more prominent scholars and scientists who uh, also agree with these views, their views don't matter. The debate is over. Al Gore has his Nobel Prize, and the film, An Inconvenient Truth, has its Academy Award. So shut up and get your mind in lockstep with the politically correct prevailing wisdom, or at least what the media tells us is the prevailing wisdom. And no questions, please. The case is closed. We have heard this dozens and dozens of times. Don't the people who are advocating global warming, who are honest, uh, people don't, doesn't that cause them reason to pause and think, why are people trying to shut down the discussion? Okay, the science has been skewed by heavy handed intervention in uh, the awarding of research grants. That's clear now. Evidenced by a propaganda barrage that would make George Orwell blush, this propaganda barrage has been aimed at the American people. So what is this theory that is now so accepted that grants were denied and that debate is deliberately stifled and that, a, again, that a barrage of propaganda is aimed at the American people to get them just to accept it? The man-made global warming theory is presented as scientific truism. So, uh, uh, so let's see, is it really? It is, let's say, Specifically, it is a disturbing theory that the Earth began warming, a warming cycle, 150 years ago. This was a warming cycle that differed greatly from all the other warming and cooling cycles that had gone on on this planet for, for the history for millenniums. And uh, for as long as the, history, the Earth has a, geogra a geologic history, there have been warmings and coolings. But this warming cycle of 150 years ago, we keep being told, is not like all the other cycles. This one is tied directly to mankind's use of fossil fuels, basically coal and oil. These so-called fossil fuels that have powered our industries and made civilization possible are, 
we have been told, causing a global warming catastrophe. The weather is changing. It's getting hotter and hotter. After all, former Vice President Al Gore now said that, and I quote, humanity is sitting on a time bomb. The vast majority of the world's scientists are right. We have just 10 years to avert a major catastrophe that could send our entire planet's climate system into a tailspin of epic destruction involving extreme weather, floods, droughts, academic, uh, epidemics, and killer heat waves beyond anything we've ever experienced, a catastrophe of our own making, end of quote. Al said that, not acknowledging that when his statement was made, the world temperature had already ceased to climb in the previous five years. But he should be excused because he was so sure, really sure, that global warming would come back and then validate his warnings. Why was he so sure? Because fossil fuels, people like Al tell, tell us, uh, put an ever-increasing level of so-called greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and the most prevalent of, of which is carbon dioxide, CO2. This increase in CO2, we are told, causes the warming that we are now supposedly experiencing. Of course, we know that ended eight years ago, but supposedly it's, we're still experiencing it. We'll just ignore that it hasn't been getting colder or warmer for these last eight years. This man-made warming cycle, according to the theory, is rapidly approaching a tipping point as we have just heard from Al, when the world's temperature will abruptly jump and accelerate with dire and perhaps apocalyptic consequences for the entire planet. If one accepts this as fact, then man-made global warming is overwhelming our planet, even as we speak. Then we would be expected, if we believed that, that we'd be expected to accept controls, regulations, taxation, international planning and enforcement, mandated lifestyle changes, lower expectations, limits on consumer choice, as well as personal and family sacrifices, all of this we would be expected to accept as necessary to save our planet from, well, from us. And what are the costs of these controls According to the Wharton School of Ec uh, Wharton Economic Forecasting Report, complying with the Kyoto Treaty alone would reduce our country's national output by $300 billion annually and would result in the loss of 2.4 million jobs. The cap and trade legislation, now being considered in Washington, would cost American industry $600 billion. This, of course, will simply be passed on to consumers in the price of the goods that we purchase. By the way, um, when President Obama talked about there will be no new taxes for anyone with less than a $250,000 annual income, uh, did he include all of this money that was going to be added to the price of the goods that we're paying by, a, by federal uh, regulations that are trying to deal with global warming? Uh, wonder who's going to pay that $600 billion? Uh, is it just the people who make over $250,000 a year? Well, promise or no, this economically oppressive medicine will be shoved down our throats at a time of incredible hardship and economic chaos in our country. We can't afford to lose millions of jobs. To, ch uh, to charge the American taxpayer billions more in the price of the goods they buy which is little more than a thinly disguised tax, is unconscionable. We can't afford to inc increase the electric cost as much as 129 percent, which is, which is predicted. And significantly, they would like to raise the price of gasoline once more. They want it to stay at $4 a gallon. It really takes a lot to frighten people into accepting such economically destructive and personally restrictive mandates that would result from the implementing of a global warming-based agenda. That's why the debate has been stifled. Case is closed. The phony claims of consensus. That's why they want proponents of the theory. That's why the proponents of this theory have been so heavy-handed, heavy-handed enough to interfere with the unbiased 
issuances of research grants. How else, except for dishonest tactics, can they frighten people to accept the huge changes in their lives that they will be required to make by the global warming community? And these are not changes that are being made, changes for the better in their lives, otherwise they'd make them gladly and voluntarily. Inexpensive air travel, for example. The global warming alarmists believe that jet aircraft should be considered among the worst CO2 polluters. Jet travel, therefore, must be restricted. People are expected to give up the freedom to use cheap airfares. So how many people are aware of that? If the global warming fanatics have their way, there will be no more discounted airline tickets, which of course means fewer visits to see our loved ones, fewer visits to explore the world. Better known, however, is the global warming movement's commitment to severely restrict the use of private automobiles. The rich will still have their limos and, of course, their private jets. Carbon offsets will see to that. Uh, certainly Al and the others, they will be let off the hook because of these carbon offsets, which, of course, uh, Al will also profit from by organizing them in the private sector. The rest of us will not be able to travel by plane and will be stuck sitting at home or sitting next to a gang member on public transportation. If we are just staying at home, what does that leave us? Is that a better life? Outlandish global warming predictions then are designed to strike fear into the hearts of those malcontents who just won't be willing to accept giving up those low priced airfares and will not accept government mandates in their lifestyle. They just won't stay at home. Those changes, we are told, are needed to save the planet. Well, people, if proponents have their way, are just going to have to accept things like higher food prices and, importantly, less meat in their diet. That's right. They want to wean us away from meat. A 2006 report entitled Livestock Along, Livestock's Long Shadow to the United Nations mentions livestock emissions and grazing, and it places part of the blame for global warming squarely on the hind parts of cows. Cows are to be added to the list of greenhouse emitting machines. So not only are we then going to be forced to cut our personal air travel and our ground transportation, as I say, which keeps us at home. But then when we stay home, we can't even have a barbecue. And heck, they won't even let us have a hamburger. I'd point out uh, that before the introduction of cattle to the United States, millions upon millions of buffalo dominated the Great Plains of America. They were so thick you, you could not see where one herd began and where the other ended. One can only assume that the anti-meat man-made global warming crowd must believe that buffalo farts have some redeeming value that's better than the flatulence emitted by cattle. Underscoring this dishonesty of the global warming fanatics, in my attempt to make light of the argument that cattle production is an evil element of our, wor of our world, I once suggested in jest that perhaps dinosaur flatulence changed the climate back in those days, which, you know, may have ended the time of the, of, the, uh, of the dinosaurs. Well, it was widely reported that I was serious when I said that. Anyone who could suggest that I was serious and not making light of the other person's, and I say respectfully making light of the other person's argument, anybody who reports that I was serious, that I really believe that dinosaurs were extinct because of flagellants, is intentionally portraying something that they know not to be true or they're just ignorant. But I believe they are not, that, that we're not talking about ignorant people. We're talking about people who are portraying things that they know not to be true as if it were true. What we have here, of course, is steely-eyed fanaticism by those on the other side of the global warming debate. People clearly blinded by fanaticism and thus are unable to grasp nuance, unable to grasp a bit of honest and, and, and humor uh, added to a debate, and certainly unable to honestly examine an opposing argument. But let's look at the proof these zealots give us to back up their claim of global warming that's threatening our planet. 
Let's be honest enough to have an open minded to what they're presenting us. First, let's note that the baseline used to prove global warming is 1850. This is what, and I've been through hearing after hearing in the Science Committee. 1850, by the way, is the year in which they judge whether the planet's getting warmer or cooler or what. And 1850, by the way, also marks something else. It marks the end, at the bottom end, the final end of a 500 year decline in the Earth's temperatures called the mini ice age. Yes, it was a cycle trending down for about 500 years and it all started, got down to about 1850 when it started trending up. 1850 is the baseline for judging warming of our planet does that make any sense? They are making comparisons against a temperature that was the bottom end of a 500 year decline in temperature. I pointed that out at numerous hearings and in numerous debates, and the issue continues to be ignored. So if anyone out there is listening and is honest, please give us an answer. Isn't 1850 a dishonest date to use as a baseline to prove that the earth is getting warmer? Isn't the statistical base clearly flawed when you start at a low point? Then there are, of course, the predictions that we've heard. In testimony before Congress 20 years ago, NASA's James Hansen predicted CO2 would shoot up and global temperatures would shoot up by more than one-third of a degree Celsius during the 1990s, and the trend would then escalate. The ri a rise in temperature was predicted, and it would lead to what? Rising sea levels, cities underwater, droughts and famines, and of course, an increase in tropical diseases. Yes, tropical diseases. Sometimes it's difficult for me when radical environmentalists use that as an example, considering that tropical diseases, especially malaria, have killed millions of children in the third world because radical environmentalists have been successful in banning DDT. But that is another issue. It has been a while since the apocalyptic predictions uh, by global warming fanatics were made. Were these predictions correct? Mr. Hansen said the temperature would rise by a third of a degree just a little over a decade ago, and the answer is the predictions turned out to be dramatically wrong. Temperatures during that decade rose only one-third of what was predicted by Mr. Hansen, a modest increase to the point that it would alarm nobody and would be of little difference than any of the other many cycle changes that we've seen in our, on our planet over, its, over our planet's millions of years of history. Uh, and uh, again, over the past eight years, there hasn't even been a modest rise of temperature, again, as differentiated from what Mr. Hansen predicted. We shouldn't be surprised. Climate modeling, which is the basis of almost all alarmist predictions, is not an exact science. No weather or climate model has ever been accurate to the point that the alarmist would have us believe. This was stunningly clear when Dr. Hansen called for an anti-global warming protest here in Washington two weeks ago that my colleague Mr. Poe just talked about. The day the demonstrators arrived coincided with the worst snowstorm in a year and the coldest March 2nd in more than a decade. So let's look at the other predictions. He was dead wrong. <laughs> he was dead wrong to try to call a global warming uh, demonstration on the coldest day of the year because he didn't think it would be cold. Numerous and other powerful hurricanes were forecast uh, by the National Hurricane Center for NOAA and others. Okay, that's what we were going to have. Uh, the last decade, the global warming people said we're going to have more and more hurricanes. Well, if for the last eight years, it hasn't been getting warmer, and we haven't seen more hurricanes. Yes, as I stated earlier, the number of hurricanes is at a 30-year low. During the Clinton administrations, scientists produced a study, and then another study, and another study, predicting the horrific impact of the unstoppable onslaught of man-made global warming. Droughts, fires, polar ice caps melting, mass extinctions, all of this, uh, report after report, what I call chicken little science. We were led to believe this nightmare would be overwhelming us by now. Of course, uh, there was even a hint, uh, if the, of course, if there was even a hint 
that the conclusion wouldn't back up this global warming theory, the scientists who applied wouldn't have seen one red cent of federal research money. And just recently, Tom Knudsen, research meteorologist for the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, that's NOAA, that's the ones who ended up not being able to give Dr. Gray any research grants, this gentleman, Mr. Knudsen, now says that he has reviewed the evidence and totally changed his mind and now admits he was wrong about global warming and the increase in hurricane activities. So here is a scientist with integrity. Such scientific integrity did not always rise to the occasion. Contrary to what all those scientists living on their federal research grants predicted, the world hasn't been getting warmer. As I say, in the fact, in the last eight years, there's been no warming at all. Global snowfall is at record levels, and there are fewer, not more, hurricanes. And yes, there's some melting in the Arctic. We all know that. We hear about it over and over again. In fact, NBC did a special on the melting of the Arctic and how bad it is, showing pictures of penguins sitting on diminished pieces of ice in the Arctic. The problem is, penguins don't live in the Arctic. They, there are no penguins in the Arctic. They live in the Antarctic. And, there, and so NBC had it wrong. Somebody must have told them that the penguins from the Arctic were being victimized by global warming. In fact, the Antarctic, where the penguins live, there is a buildup of ice going on. It is getting colder uh, in the Antarctic. Now, in the Arctic, of course, we recognize there's been some rise in temperatures. That due, which many experts tell us, to, the, uh, to ocean currents that have changed in the last few years. But emphatically, it is not due to CO2 that comes from somebody's SUV. The Arctic is, in fact, returning to the temperature levels of the 1940s. And what about the disappearing polar bears? Are the polar bears really disappearing? Dr. Mitchell Taylor from the Department of Environmental Studies under the Canadian Territorial uh, Government of Nevoit, which is a leading environmental uh, university, and other experts suggest that all but two types of polar bears are flourishing. So yes, two types of polar bears out of 13 type, different types of polar bears Two of those types are in decline. The rest of the polar bears, the population is expanding. So there are more polar bears. Let me say that, more polar bears. But here we are understanding there are more polar bears in the world with a spectacle of polar bears being put onto the endangered species list with a caveat that they really aren't endangered now, but with global warming, they are expected to dwindle. Never mind, it's not the global warming trend stopped eight years ago. Unfortunately, the debate on this case is not closed. So emerging obvious differences between reality and theory need to be addressed by people who have been advocating the global warming theory. Even without going outside and checking the thermometer, it's easy to tell that the predictions of, of man-made global warming were wrong. Well, you don't have to check the thermometer. How can you tell they were wrong? Because they don't even use the word global warming anymore. The words climate change have now replaced the words global warming. Get that? Every time you hear the words climate change, it's evidence of error that they were wrong to begin with or of deceit on the part of radical environmentalists. So no matter what happens from now on, climate change has replaced global warming, and whether it's hotter or cooler, it can be presented as further indication that humans have caused the change that's taking place. No, there's been changes in our weather forever. You have always had adjustments up and down trends and cycles. We just need to ask ourselves, if a salesman gives a strong pitch and claims it's something, uh, and, and makes claims about something that is later to be found out to be wrong, totally wrong. When do you stop trusting the salesman? Then if he starts playing word games and changing the actual words that he's using about the same product, but and rather than just admitting that he was wrong, he just changes the words that he's using, but he's talking about the same product. Isn't it reasonable to stop trusting this person? Yes, Al Gore and company, we have noticed that you are now saying climate change rather than global warming. 
They've tried to slip it in, but we have noticed. So why the alteration? Why are they doing that? That's because the world has not been getting warmer these last eight years as they predicted and everybody's beginning to notice it. So we actually see a beehive of activity now because of this. Those federally funded scientists who were sucked into this are now trying to save themselves some modicum of credibility. This even as more and more scientists speak up and publicly disassociate themselves with the scientific claims of global warming that have been foisted upon us. To understand all this nonsense, you have to go back and look at the basic scientific assumptions that are being used by the global warming alarmists. They claim that excessive amounts of man-made CO2 are being deposited in the air, which causes a greenhouse effect that warms the atmosphere. They call this increase in CO2 mankind's carbon footprint. The global warming an analysts want us to judge everything by its carbon footprint. What that means is how much CO2 is being released as a result of that specific activity is a carbon footprint. They adamantly believe that it is CO2 that causes our planet to warm and that more CO2, the hotter it will get, and the increasing CO2 problem, well, why is CO2 increasing? According to these folks, that's due to us. And although mankind is responsible for significantly less than 10% of all CO2 on the, in the Earth's atmosphere, we are told climate change is our fault. Can one huge volcano spew more CO2 into the atmosphere than all the people of the world? Yes, but that's still our fault. Can one huge fire like the one we've had recently in Australia throw just as much CO2 into the air? Yes, but it's still our fault. Rotting trees in the Amazon and the byproduct of rot and termites may cause even more CO2 than what people put into the air, all of the people on the planet? Well, yes. But again, it's our fault that CO2 is rising. This concept, just like the uh, extrapolations from their computers, is wrong, dead wrong. Uh, Andrea Kapsida, a Russian geographer and, uh, and Antarctic and, and ice core researcher, slammed the UN IPPC, IPCC as, quote, this is the report, the UN IPCC report, that, that has been used to uh, uh, justify all of the, this, this monstrous and, and very uh, dangerous global warming agenda. Well, this uh, Russian uh, core, ice core researcher suggests, and I quote, it's the biggest scientific fraud and, and, and the Kyoto theorists have put the cart before the horse. It is global warming that triggers higher levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, not the other way around. Furthermore, he went on to point out, quote, a large number of critical docu documents submitted, submitted uh, at the 1995 UN conference in Madrid vanished without a trace. As a result, the discussion was one-sided and heavily biased, and the UN declared global warming to be a scientific fact. We found out that the level of CO2 had fluctuated greatly over the period, but at any given time, increases in air temperature proceed the higher concentrations of CO2. This is exactly opposite from what is the basis of the whole global warming argument. So this is the challenge. Many promises, prominent scientists, including the head of the Russian Academy of Science, who I recently met with, I might add, talking about this issue, are now confirming that the rise in CO2 comes after global temperatures increase, not before. This has been observed in ice cores, yet this has been ignored, again, ignored by those who are screaming their warnings at us. Please, give us an answer to this challenge. Why ignore it? How can we, the American people, just accept when something is fundamental to the, to, to the uh, uh, whether or not, to the validity of the argument that's being presented to us when they just ignore challenges to the validity of their argument. If the increase in CO2 is not caused by any warming cycle, uh, then uh, if the CO2 is not the cause of a warming cycle, the world uh, you know, may experience a warming cycle, but it is not the cause. 
we have had many warming cycles in the past, but what these, these uh, scientists are telling us, the CO2 increase did not cause those warming cycles. In fact, Dr. Claude Algre, the scientist who first postulated the theory that CO2 increase was spiking the world's temperature, has now changed his mind. Officially, he says he was wrong. He told Al Gore he was wrong. Al Gore won't listen. So what is the cause of the Earth's warming and cooling cycles? If it's not CO2, you know, if the global warming crowd refuses to deal with that issue and look at that specifically and deal with that challenge, okay, well, I assume they're wrong. But what is it that we really believe do, causes these changes that have gone on uh, for millenniums in the Earth's temperature? It's called sunspots. Yes, solar activity. That explains why one sees similar temperature cycles on Mars and Jupiter to the cycles that are happening on this planet. That's why ice caps on those planets, like on ours, expand and contract. It's the sun, stupid. So, take note that the very argument upon which global warming is built has proven to be false and that man-made global warming activists will not address this issue. The most, I mean, this is the most supreme arrogance that I've witnessed in my 30 years in Washington. After all, case is closed. We don't need to discuss any more details. Yet, expert after expert keep pointing to the flaws in their central argument. And Mr. Gore's mumbo jumbo notwithstanding, the predictions have been wrong. And the CO2 premise is wrong. The methodology that has been used ha has been wrong. The observations have been wrong. The attempt to shut up those people who disagree with them has been wrong. Now I remember when I chaired the Subcommittee on Research and Science in the House, back when Republicans controlled this body. I insisted that both sides be present and that expert witnesses be expected to address each other's points and contentions. This me methodology led Al Gore to refer to me as a Stalinist. I would suggest that the propaganda campaign of the man-made global warming alarmist has much more in common than Stalinism does insist than does insisting that both sides of an issue be heard at a congressional hearing. One has to really believe that he or she has a corner on the truth to make such a complaint that, Stal that Stalinism is having both sides presented and addressing each other's points. Of course, Al Gore's documentary, An Inconvenient Truth, suggests by its title that, it is, that he should be uh, taken and what he says they should be taken as truth. Well, I won't go into the numerous debatable points and outright errors in that film, but there's something far worse in that film. This pseudoscientific documentary, this what I call chicken little science, presented numerous film segments of climate and environmental incidents, similar to those footages that you'd see from National Geographic. This added to the credibility of the points being made. Specifically, the film portrays a dramatic cracking and breaking away of a huge portion of the polar ice cap. The scene is awesome and somewhat overwhelming and leaves the audience with the feeling that they've witnessed a massive historic occurrence. Unfortunately, it's all a fake. This is not, uh, this is not grand first-hand photographic evidence. It's not National Geographic footage of a huge breakaway uh, of a portion of the ice cap. Instead, what the audience is looking at is a deceptive use of special effects. It's not the ice caps, it's styrofoam. Styrofoam, that's right. Styrofoam special effects trying to fool us into thinking we're observing an occurrence by nature. By the way, isn't styrofoam, doesn't have some oil-based product or something? Isn't there some sort of carbon footprint with styrofoam? Well, Mr. Gore has not commented on this depiction. Maybe it is inconvenient for him to comment because it may hurt his credibility. After all, it is not getting warmer as he predicted, so maybe his, uh, uh, let's say, theories that are based on styrofoam uh, are inaccurate as well. The first time I met Al Gore was in my first term in Congress back in 1989 and 90. Al Gore was then the uh, United States Senator, and he marched into the science room, followed by a platoon of cameras and reporters. He sat in front of our committee demanding that President Bush, that's George W.'s father, 
declare an ozone emergency. He waved a report in his hand as evidence that there was an ozone hole opening up right over the northeast of the United States. A few days later, the report touted by Senator Gore was found to have been based on faulty data. Data collected by one so-called researcher flying a single engine Piper Cub with limited technology and no experience. The emergency declaration the senator called for would have had severe negative consequences on the people who live in the northeast part of the United States. Now, does anyone detect a pattern here? Such a scare tactic, as I say, chicken littleism based on false information? Well, it isn't new. We have, have many examples, not just of Al Gore, but of others you, playing this sort of a tactic in order to get their way. In 1957, the FDA recalled three million pounds of cranberries. Year, a few years later, the FDA admitted it was a total mistake. Sorry, of course, it was, there was a tremendous price to be paid. Large number of our farmers went out of business. They went broke because nobody had their cranberries for Thanksgiving or Christmas. Then, of course, there was the scare over cyclamate used in everyday items like soda, jams, ice cream. It was very sweet and extremely low in calories. In the early 70s, the FDA banned cyclamates as a cancer hazard. Well, come to find out, the rats in their study had been force-fed the equivalent of 350 cans of soda a day, and only eight of the 240 rats that they had crammed with all the soda, only, uh, uh, what was it, uh, only eight of those 240 actually got sick. It was a faulty test, and eventually, years later, the truth finally prevailed, and it was officially recognized that cyclamate does not cause cancer. Canada, by the way, never banned cyclamates. Our northern buddies, I guess, just couldn't get themselves to force feed those rats. Well, the FDA did take it back, uh, and uh, there w then it, it said it came up with the truth, finally. However, great damage was done. This episode had serious consequences. It was the cyclamic ban that led to the introduction of high fructose corn syrup with the obesity and health problems that have come with high fructose corn syrup. So yes, another scare tactic, another American industry, cyclamates, decimated, another rotten theory with unintended consequences foisted upon us. The next example of fear-mongering uh, with pseudoscience came in February of 1989. On the evening of uh, February 26th, Americans tuned in to 60 Minutes and heard Ed Bradley say, quote, the most potent cancer-causing agent in our food supply is a substance sprayed on apples to keep them on the tree, end of quote. He went on to warn that children were being put at risk by eating aller-dusted apples. The story snowballed out of control, climaxing with actress Meryl Streep's testimony before Congress. Frantic parents tossed apples out the window, schools removed applesauce from the cafeteria, and replaced those apples and that applesauce with more safe, nutritious sub substances, like ice cream and pudding. Well, there's only one small problem. Alar, which is what was on the apples, didn't cause cancer. <laughs> A uh, study later found out that that was wrong. 20,000 apple growers in the United States suffered enormous harm. Then, of course, there was Three Mile Island, another fake, another situation where people were stampeded. And what we ended up with that, no one was hurt at Three Mile Island. But instead, what we did was it created a political momentum that destroyed our ability to utilize nuclear energy in the United States. Instead, now we are based, we're still based on coal and other fuels. We are based on oil and other fuels that we now have to buy from people overseas. Jane Fonda's movie, China Syndrome, helped create the, the scare. It has had an enormously negative impact. Ironically, today, radical environmentalists, environmentalists still make attempts to, expand, to stop the expansion of nuclear energy uh, for, built, for producing our electricity, even as we remain dependent on foreign oil and continue to use coal-fired plants. Then we know about the ozone, hair layer, the ozone hole in Latin America, which was supposed to be around for decades. And then, mysteriously, it just naturally closed up after just a few years. Again, another cycle of nature presented to us as if there was some major problem with human activity. Of course, what we've got is an example of 
uh, and we've already been presented to us by my colleague, where people just a few years ago were talking about global cooling in the same way that they now talk about global warming. Then there was, of course, acid rain. Ronald Reagan, thank God, stood firm and instead of putting the controls on our economy to stop so-called acid rain, insisted on a long-term scientific research and, a, and that, research, when that research came out, it verified that acid rain was not caused by uh, people and it was not the problem that was being portrayed to us. So we have seen these tactics over and over again. Uh, and uh, so what we should be doing when we hear people trying to scare us into accepting controls, accepting uh, higher taxes, we, what we need to do is make sure that the science, their science is challenged and that we do so with an open mind. Our goal should not be to end uh, global warming because it doesn't exist. We should be focusing on global pollution, not CO2, but the pollutants that will hurt our people. One of the great damages that, that the global warming people are doing to us today is focusing our attention on CO2 when we should be focusing our attention on the other pollutants that threaten the health of our people. We don't need to save the planet by uh, utilizing certain energy. We need to save the human beings on this planet. And the CO2 focus of the global warming crowd is causing the great damage to the well-being of our people by focusing us on the wrong enemy. I would now ask that the rest of my uh, statement be made part of the record and would uh, yield back uh, uh, my time to my colleague, Mr. Poe. Without objection, so ordered.